I'm here at a shingle beach and I want to talk about how shingles created uh, and where it occurs and why it's interesting. A shingle are stones two to 200 uh, millimeters in diameter and most shingle beaches are at the higher latitudes so they're common um, uh, a lot of northern uh, parts in um, Canada and Scandinavia etc. 30% uh, of the UK is surrounded by uh, shingle beaches and in the south uh, you get shingle in New Zealand and southern South America and so on. So where does this material come from? A lot of it is glacial in origin which explains why uh, uh, shingle beaches are particularly common on the coat, on the, the poles. Uh, it can also, it can occur in the tropics from coral uh, and then it can occur from eroding cliffs. This is Dunwich in Suffolk in southern England uh, and if I was here uh, a thousand years ago then the coastline would actually be one to two kilometers out there. So all of this material has eroded away. And Dunwich itself used to be a major port. It had eight churches, it had two members of parliament, uh, but all of this has eroded away, just leaving the remains of a monastery on the clifftops, which I'm sure eventually will fall into the sea. So uh, the other key element is the action of the waves and the way in which wave action works is that incoming waves tend to be much more powerful uh, and so they'll push the material up the shore and then the retreating waves will be much weaker and that will carry less material down the shore. So if this is a pebble beach the pebbles will be pushed up the shore uh, and be harder for them to retreat so the beach will be steep. If this is a sandy shore as this is here then the beach will be much flatter because uh, the sand can actually be washed down again. And then in the polar regions in the northern and southern latitude the, the currents are stronger and the waves are stronger which is another reason why you get more shingle uh, at higher latitudes. Another process is if you can see the waves are coming in at an angle as they usually do on this piece of shore but they go out straight out to sea. So that means that there's a zigzag process. Materials brought in at an angle, go straight out to sea, brought in at an angle and keeps going. And so this will zigzag down the coast, a process called longshore drift. So perhaps at a meter or so a year, material is being pushed down the shore, uh, creating shingle and sand further downstream. So shingle beaches tend to occur at the higher latitudes because the waves are stronger, there's more material, particularly from glacial action. Um, uh, but if you, if you look at shingle beaches, they kind of, they look fairly tough conditions for species to grow in. And what I'd like to do now is go to another shingle beach and talk about how species can survive. I moved further south uh, to Albra, so uh, we were up there earlier and the material that we were looking at earlier will have been washed down here over time through longshore drift. And you can see that this is a very shingly beach, so the sea here will be dynamic, it's exposed out there, it's deep, so this is a high energy environment. In low energy environments where it's shallow or buffered uh, or within a bay uh, you then get uh, uh, sand because the, um, the sand is then not washed away. So how do plants survive under these conditions? Well it's actually quite difficult conditions. So if you look at the, um, the shingle here 
you can see that it's, there's very little for it to grow on, it's dry, it's nutrient poor, there's just large particles. It's very difficult for plants to grow in that sort of environment. Uh, but I've dug down here uh, and you can see if you dig down that it's very wet there, it quite feels uh, conspicuously damp uh, and there's a lot of nutrient as you can see from my fingertips, uh, lots of organic matter um, uh, and lots of small particles as well. So it's much better growing conditions lower down uh, below this surface layer. So the strategy then of many st species is to have deep tap roots that go deep down in the shingle to find this nutrient, to find this water, to find smaller particles that roots can then grow amongst. So example will be the sea kale. Sea kale has these leathery leaves to reduce water loss. It's got all sorts of adaptations to survive high salt conditions. And it has a deep tap root. And this is true for a range of species growing in this environment. The, um, the yellow horned poppy, uh, as you can see here, uh, I think a beautiful looking flower, again has fleshy leaves and a deep taproot. Not quite as spectacular, but this sea plantain likewise has fleshy leaves and a deep taproot. What other strategies do plants have here? This is the sea pea, uh, and this grows low down to avoid uh, wind and sea spray. Uh, and um, because there's very little fertility here, it has the strategy of producing its own nitrogen in combination uh, with uh, bacteria so it has nitrates that it can then use and then grow uh, and then it has these seeds uh, and these seeds can float and then survive for many years in seawater and this means that it can disperse well and this is probably why the species is found throughout the world because it is such a good disperser and then the sea campion Again, C. campion has a, a deep tap root, but if you look, you can see all this, all, all this material growing. It sprawls over the ground, and then there's all this organic matter here. And so this is often an early successional stage species on the shingle habitats, and having grown, it then produces uh, more organic matter, more um, uh, nutrients, so that other species can then colonize, and then there'll be a wide range of other species that will follow. So shingle has a range of characteristic plants with uh, adaptations to growing in these difficult conditions. There's also a range of birds, many terns and gulls and shorebirds, uh, breed in this habitat and a range of characteristic insects that will survive these difficult conditions and have restricted ranges because they only tend to occur under shingle conditions. So a fascinating environment and species do manage to survive under these rather arduous conditions.